Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Are you feeling that you should go to sleep now? Some of you will be sleeping while I'm preaching. You're so very tired. Will you manage to keep awake? Yes. Uh -huh. God bless you. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you very much for how you blessed us today. Thank you for the way you are still blessing us. And we know that your blessing will continue upon us as your children and your servants tonight. We're praying, Lord, you touch our lives. Turn us around. Transform us, Lord. Make us better ministers in the vineyard of God. Let your anointing multiply upon every life here tonight. And let the anointing break the yoke. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said a good amen. amen. Thank you. Just to keep me awake. We're looking at Revelation chapter 2. And in Revelation chapter 2, we're looking at verses 8 through 11. We're talking about the power and the preservation of the persecuted church. Unto the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy, the slander, the reproach of them, which say they are Jews and are not, and are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, and ye may be that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation, trial, trouble, testing ten days. And I will give thee a crown of life. Be faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt in a second death. As we come to the church in Smyrna, we come to a church that suffered persecution. This was a persecuted church but you see here the persecution purified the church the persecution purged the church you know why no one wants to suffer for what he does not sincerely wholeheartedly believe and anybody in that church when they remained in that church it meant that they actually believed what they were standing for because the persecution was so intense Hypocrites don't want to stay in a despised church, a suffering church, except they are secret agents or spies for the enemy of the church. Persecution drives the church to prayer, to receive strength and power. A church standing together in persecution against their oppressors are usually united, concentrating on the essentials of the faith. And such a persecuted church will be free from non-essentials and trivialities. Persecution also strengthens the church's conviction as she examines and re-examines the reason for the suffering. What's the result of suffering? What's the result of persecution? Purity. Patience. Spiritual strength and power. Prayerfulness, consecration, unity, conviction, self-examination. All these are the results of persecution. Turn in your Bible to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. Reading from verse 3. We're tracing, we're following, we're chasing after the results and the marks of persecution what persecution does to a church romans chapter 5 verse 3 and not only so but we glory in tribulation in trials in troubles in persecution also knowing that tribulation persecution trouble trial the trial of our faith work at patience that's the result 
and patience experience and experience hope and hope make us not ashamed because the love of god is shed abroad in our hearts by the holy ghost which is given unto us james chapter one in james chapter one we're further given the results of persecution james chapter one verse three knowing this that the trying of your faith worketh patience but let patience have a perfect work that she may be perfect and entire lacking nothing wanting nothing first peter chapter 1 verse 7 telling us what persecution brings it doesn't destroy us it purifies us first peter chapter 1 verse 7 that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perishes though it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of jesus christ and then we're told in second peter chapter one reading from verse 16 for we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our lord jesus christ but were eyewitnesses of his majesty for you receive from god the father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased and this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount it's been talking about trial persecution to this church but it then said that has made us to re-examine our faith when we were persecuted we began to wonder what we're following what we're suffering for are we suffering in vain then the answer came back no it cannot be they re-examined their faith persecution suffering led them to re-examine what they were standing on and then they said now we know we're not following cunningly devised fables or we are there on the mount with him i said persecution leads us to prayer in acts of the apostles chapter 4 acts of the apostles chapter 4 reading from verse 23 and being led being let go they went to their own company and they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them and when they had had that they lifted up their voice to god with one accord and said lord thou art god which has made heaven and earth and sea and all that therein is and then as they went on verse 32 and a multitude of them that believed were all of one heart and of one soul neither said any of them that ought of the things which they possessed was his own but they had all things common verse 33 and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the lord jesus and great grace was upon them all the result of persecution it led them to prayer and it gave them boldness authority and it declared the word of god without shame in first peter chapter 5 verse 10 the result of persecution first peter chapter 5 verse 10 but god the god of all grace who has called us unto his eternal glory by christ jesus after that ye have suffered a while, make you perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. And you see then that persecution is not a bad thing because it leads you to grow in the Lord. The church in Smyrna was persecuted because of their devotion and allegiance to the Lord Jesus Christ. And because they refused to worship Caesar. You need to understand at that time, uh, the people in the land, they worshipped Caesar as their God, as their idol. Even the pagan Jews and the pagan Greeks, with all the other people in Smyrna, they all worshipped in huge shrines, in temples that lined the streets of the city. But the church remained committed 
to the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because they will not participate in emperor worship, which was compulsory at that time, those Christians that refused to burn any pinch of incense in those temples dedicated to the emperors, they suffered a lot. That's why they were persecuted. But the Lord was with them. And if you are going through persecution, the Lord will be with you. The protection of the Lord will be with you. There are three points we are going to consider. Number one, proclamation by Christ, the first and the last. Proclamation by Christ, the first and the last. Number two, the persecution of Christ's faithful followers. The persecution of Christ's faithful followers. Point number three, promise from Christ to the fearless and the faithful. Promise from Christ to the fearless and to the faithful. Come to number one. The proclamation of Christ or proclamation by Christ, the first and the last. See the way Jesus Christ introduced himself in Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2 verse 8. And unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These things says the first and the last which was dead and is and is alive again here is the introduction that jesus christ gave and this introduction if you go back to chapter one you will find this introduction chapter one verse 11 saying i am alpha and omega the first and the last and then in verse 17 and when i saw him i fell at his feet as dead and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Here is the introduction of the Lord Jesus Christ saying, Before me there was nothing else, the first. And after me there will be nothing else, the last. I'm the beginning and the ending. I'm the alpha and the omega. And whatever you are going through in your short space of life, understand i've been there before it came and i'll be there when it's over the first and the last be confident in the lord all those people that are persecuting you before they came on the scene i was here and after they are passed away like water under the bridge never to be remembered anymore i will still be there I came before them, I will outlast them. I'm the first and the last. In Revelation chapter 22, Revelation chapter 22, reading from verse 13, you will see how the Lord still continued to describe himself. Revelation chapter 22, reading there in verse 13, it says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last, praise the Lord. Uh, do you understand that even this title, the first and the last, it was the title that Almighty God used himself for himself. In the Old Testament, when the prophets referred to the first and the last, they were referring to the Almighty God. They were referring to the ancient of days. They were referring to the one that didn't have a beginning and didn't have any ending. And the same title that Almighty God used for himself, Jesus Christ also used for himself. Which means then that Jesus Christ and the Father God in heaven, they are co-existent, co-eternal. And that the same characteristics, the same attributes you find in the Father, you also find in the Son. Look at Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah 41, reading verse 4. It says, Who has wrought and done it, calling the generation from the beginning, I the Lord, the first and the last, I am he, that's almighty God, referring to himself, the first and the last. You understand then the same title used by God the Father. It's also used by God the Son. In Isaiah chapter 44, reading from verse 6, Isaiah 44 verse 6, Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. And beside me there is no God. And you see how great 
Jesus Christ is? Do you see how exalted Jesus Christ is? Do you see the divinity and the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ equal with the Father? I and my Father are one. In Isaiah chapter 48, Isaiah chapter 48, reading there in verse 12, 48 verse 12, Akin unto me, O, J o Jacob and Israel, my called, I am he, I am the first, and also I am the last. Mine hand also has laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand has spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. That's the Almighty God. And it's wonderful to know then that Jesus Christ, our Lord and Redeemer, the same, the same, or the Father. Then he introduced himself. Come back to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. There's another introduction that Jesus Christ gave to himself. And it refers to how he came and died for you and for me. But then he was buried and then he rose again. So it said in chapter, in chapter 2, verse 8, it said, which was dead and is, and then is alive now. It said this in chapter 1 of Revelation, chapter 1 of Revelation, reading in verse 18, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. And I have the keys of hell and of death. It's a wonderful thing to belong to Jesus Christ. As Jesus presented himself, as he introduces himself to the angel, to the messenger, to the pastor of the church, at the beginning of this message, see the title he used. And I've shown you already that he took this title from chapter 1. And these titles are appropriate to the state and the condition and the need of the church. Because he is the living Savior. He is the living Lord. As he had himself triumphed over death in all its forms. He was telling them he was now alive forevermore. That he is able to make them conquer death. And he is able to make you conquer death. You will conquer I said you will conquer. He was assuring them because he has conquered death, he will protect them also from the second death, from the eternal death. Christ Jesus, the first and the last. The same title used of God, used for him, proving that Jesus is God, yet distinct and different from the Father. Christ is eternal, the first and the last. He has always lived throughout the past and it will continue to live through all eternity that is yet to come because of this it's a showing manner and it's assuring you today and assuring the church at any time i will accomplish all my purposes because i'm always alive i will execute all my plans because i am always alive has god given you any promise has jesus given you any promise is alive forevermore to uphold that promise and that promise will be yes and amen in jesus name and because it's alive forevermore death and the messengers of death will not have power over you you will overcome you will triumph no matter what the people of the world throw at you understand the first and the last is with you the one that conquered death is with you and the one that conquered satan on the cross of calvary that jesus christ is with you he will never fail you in jesus name when he said i was dead and i'm alive again this at once identified him to the people in manner that this is the lord jesus christ for to no one else could this apply he had been put to death but he had risen from the grave now it's alive forevermore and death will not have any power over him anymore and it says because i overcame you too you will overcome always alive always alive he can sustain us in our persecution in our suffering he will see to it that in all our trials his plan will still be fulfilled when the persecution comes your way what should you be expecting you shouldn't expect destruction or backsliding understand if god permits any persecution to come to you the end result will be number one purging it will purge you 
Maybe there are some redundant things in your life, non-essentials in your life. All that that persecution will do is that it will purge you. Always remember, always remember, when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were thrown into the fire, it is the rope, the property of Nebuchadnezzar, that burnt in that fire. Anything that God made with them, their body, the least, the, the least part of them did not burn. When you go through the fire of persecution, it's only the redundant things, the non-essentials, the things of Nebuchadnezzar on you that you didn't know was there that will be burned. But your property will not be burned. Your soul will not be burned. The gift of God of, in you will not be burned. The persecution comes only to bring purging. Number two, purity. It will purify you. Number three, patience. Number four, power, spiritual power, spiritual strength. And number five, it will bring prayerfulness. And then number six, it will bring preparedness for the second coming of the Lord. Because of that persecution, you will be say, I want to be ready. I want to be ready. And you will be ready. Point number two, the persecution of Christ's faithful followers. The persecution of Christ's faithful followers followers look at verse 9 in revelation chapter 2 verse 9 i know thy works and tribulation and poverty what an encouragement sometimes brothers and sisters when you're going through some deep waters when you're going through some burning flame you think nobody understands nobody knows and nobody can really empathize, sympathize with me. Nobody can have real compassion. They don't know what I'm going through. There's somebody who knows what you are going through. And it will not allow that fire to burn you. It will not allow that thing to sink your soul. It's going to be with you every... Yes, you understand. Yes, you understand. Wipe your tears away. The Lord Jesus Christ is watching over you and moderating everything. Don't be so sorrowful. He says, I know, I know, I know. When he said, I know, he was talking about intimate knowledge. He was talking about the most intimate acquaintance with all that pertains to that church. In particular, he knew their tribulation. And then look at that verse 9. He says, I know your works, your tribulation your poverty then in bracket it said they say you are poor but i say you are rich i said you are rich i said you are rich because tell me if they say somebody is poor in material things but he's rich in faith and if you can believe god and you remain and you have that richness of faith all things are possible for him who believes what money cannot buy, faith will get. What popularity cannot, what popularity cannot get, faith will get. And what the people of the world, you don't have long legs, but you have faith. And what the long leg in the world cannot give you, faith will give you. And so Jesus said, they say you are poor because they don't see the material things of the world, but you are rich. You are rich in the love of God. You are rich in the grace of God. You are rich in faith. You are rich in the eternal inheritance that the Lord has given unto you. It says, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of them, which say they are Jews and are not, but the synagogue of Satan. There, there were people that were putting some pressure on them. There, there are three things we'll find in this church. Uh, number one, there was pressure. Number two, there was poverty. Number three, there was persecution. Their tribulation, their trials, and their troubles were like placing a heavy rock on a man's chest until it crushes him to death. That's what, why Jesus said, I was dead, but I'm alive again. And I'm alive again so that you will not die. And I will give you life eternal. The Greek word for poverty in this passage means abject absolute poverty complete destitution and it's not one when it says blasphemy it actually means the slander the reproaches the piercing painful insults that the people were putting on them the church in smyrna was under intense pressure intense poverty intense persecution but you'll see what jesus christ said in verse 10 it says fear none 
of those things which thou shalt suffer it says it will, it will come it's persecution because you belong to the but don't, don't be afraid behold the devil shall cast some of you into the into prison that ye may be tried that she may be tested but then it said and ye shall have tribulation that means trouble and trial it's not talking about the great tribulation the church will not pass through the great tribulation it's talking about trouble trial temptation testing he said you'll have trial trouble tribulation 10 days just a few days just a short time be thou faithful unto death even if it requires death be faithful unto death but you know not one moment or minute or one day in your life will be cut short you the lord will fulfill all your days and then he says i will give you a crown of life i will give you a crown of life if you overcome at the end you are going to wear a crown as you look at this church this is one of two churches of the seven churches with no rebuke from christ no correction from christ no condemnation from christ it was a pure church in an hostile environment persecution perfected them persecution purified them persecution strengthened them in their suffering life was dangerous in manner because if anybody refused to bow the knee to caesar if anybody refused to worship caesar as deity as a little god that person was really having danger in front of him because they could do anything that was the that was what caused the intense persecution the church in smyrna was persecuted rendered poor denied their civic rights blasphemed and slandered because of a number of reasons number one why were they persecuted so intensely number one because of unswerving loyalty to christ they said christ is lord jesus is lord and because of that we're not going to bow the knee to caesar because of the unswerving unchanging unadulterated loyalty to christ that's why they were persecuted number two uncompromising faithfulness to god's word they said we know the word we love the word and we're not going to compromise the word because of that that's why they were persecuted number three because of undivided devotion to christ they just worship christ they worship they adored him they exalted him and they honored him they know that the father had exalted him to be lord of lords and king of kings and therefore they worshiped him number four because of opposition to emperor worship because they will not worship caesar as god that's why they were persecuted number five because of refusal to associate with the pagan jews who refused who professed to be worshiping god but were actually the synagogue of satan but you see the persecution that came on this church did not destroy them you would have thought that the church had every reason to collapse or to backslide. But no, they remained faithful and rich in faith. They remained faithful and rich in love. They remained faithful and they were rich in grace. They remained faithful and they were rich in holiness. They remained faithful they were rich in spiritual power. This poor, persecuted, pure church has survived and present history tells us that it is still that church is still alive northern part of africa persecuted purified preserved persecuted yes purified definitely preserved that's the promise of god point number three promise from christ to the fearless and the faithful the promise of Christ to the fearless and to the faithful. Uh, understand, Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2 verse 10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. And then at the latter part of verse 10, it says, Be thou faithful unto death. And I will give thee a crown of life. Then in verse 11, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says 
unto the churches. Do we have ears to hear? I said, do we have ears to hear? Permit me to tell you, do what I say. Will you do what I say? Touch your ears now. I say, my ear, you will hear the word. He that has an ear, he that has an ear, he that has an ear, let him hear, let him hear, let him hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. What's the Spirit of God saying to you? Fear none, fear nothing, fear nobody, be faithful unto death. Don't be afraid again, because your Jesus is greater than the devil. He that lives within you is greater than he that is in the world, the first and the last, the alpha and the omega, the one that was dead and is alive again, is living inside you. There is nothing to fear. You will not be afraid in Jesus' name. And then he says, be faithful unto death. Be faithful to the word of God. Be faithful to the calling the Lord has given you. Be faithful in the things that the Lord is commending you about. The Lord is saying, you have done well in this area. You have done well in this area. You have done well in this area. Keep it up. And don't let persecution or the pressure coming from the world get you from the tower, get you from the high level where you are. You have graduated from all these other things. The Lord is praising you. The Lord is appreciating you. Keep it up and be faithful. Just go on that same level until the very end. And the Lord will give you a crown of life in Jesus' name. You see, Christ's promises, they're given to the fearless and the faithful. Because you cannot be faithful if you are fearful. Did you hear me? You cannot be faithful if you are fearful. It is only the fearless that can be faithful. Now, we must understand that actually there is nothing to fear. And the Lord is telling you over and over and over again, be not afraid. I said, be not afraid. In Isaiah, Isaiah, reading from chapter 57, Isaiah 57, I'm reading to you from verse 11. Isaiah 57, verse 11. And of old, hast thou been afraid or feared that thou hast lied and hast not remembered me, nor laid it to heart? Have not I, have not I held my peace even of old? And thou fearest me not. You see, when you are afraid, it, it makes you lie. It makes you deceive. It makes you to fidget and to tremble before men. That's what the Lord is saying. That of all you have been afraid, you have feared, and then you have lied. But the Lord is saying, oh, what are you afraid of, by the way? Isaiah chapter 51. Isaiah chapter 51, verse 12. I, even I, I am he that comforts you. God says he's going to comfort you. Who art thou that shouldest, that thou shouldest be afraid of a man that shall die? Who are you? Why are you afraid? Afraid of a man that shall die. And of the son of man which shall be made as grass. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah chapter 44. Reading there from verse 8. Isaiah chapter 44. Reading from verse 8. It says, fear ye not. I said, fear ye not. I said, fear ye not. Neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time? And have declared it. Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God, no other God. I know not any. It says because there is no other one. Nobody to compete with the Lord. Nobody to compete with Almighty God our Father in heaven. It says because of that, there is nothing for you to be afraid of. I search after 51, verse 7 and verse 8. Hearken unto me, ye that know righteousness. Do you know righteousness? The people in whose heart is my law. Fear ye not the reproach of men, neither be ye afraid of their revilings. For the moth shall eat them up like a garment, 
and the worm shall eat them like wool. But my righteousness shall be forever, and my salvation from generation to generation. You will not be afraid. You will not be afraid. Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41. I'm reading to you from verse 10. Fear thou not. I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee. And then he says, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. Whatever they are, whatever they have, magical power and superstitious power, traditional power, juju power, whatever power they have, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing. And they that strive, they that fight with thee shall perish. Thou shalt seek them and shall find them no more. Even them that contended with thee, they that war against thee shall be as nothing. And as a sin of naught, for I, the Lord thy God, will uphold thy right and saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help you. The Lord will help you. Isaiah chapter 43, 43 verse 1. But now thus says the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not. For I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I, the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior, I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia and Sheba for thee, since thou was precious in my sight. The Lord is telling you tonight, you are precious in his sight. My dear brother, my dear sister, you are precious in his sight. Because the Lord has anointed you, the Lord has appointed you, and the Lord has commissioned you, and the Lord has given you a ministry. Think about what the Lord has given you to do. Your, your position, and your place, and your privilege in the house of God. Think of how God has made you a blessing to the people of God. They see you and they are happy. They see you and they are challenged. And they see you and they say, as long as, as I see brother so and so, you know, my heart is just, is just resting. Because his life is encouraging me. And his uh, ministry is encouraging me. The Lord has put you in a very conspicuous ministry. And you are doing something important in the sight of the Lord. It says, you are precious in his sight. And thou hast been honorable. I love you. The Lord says he loves you. Isn't that wonderful? Therefore, I will give men for thee and people for thy life. Verse 5, fear not, for I am with thee. I will bring thy seed from the east and gather thee from the west. The, the promise of God is sure. Let me have a good amen. In Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 1, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 17. You're a minister of God, you're a preacher of the gospel. It is nothing to be afraid of. Jeremiah 1, 17, thou therefore gather up thy loins. And arise and speak unto them. All that I command thee, be not dismayed at their faces, lest I confront thee before them. Behold, for behold, I have made thee this day a defensed city, and an iron pillar, and brazen walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, and against the princes thereof, against the priests thereof, and against the people of the land. They shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. They shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. Now, please, my brothers and sisters, you know, uh, some of these people that go to all these mushroom churches and mushroom assemblies, uh, they see one vision there. And they only see half of the vision. They don't see the complete vision. Well, they come to you and they say, well, I know that you are deeper life and uh, you don't believe visions and revelations and dreams, but I'll tell you anyway 
uh, the, our, in our place, they saw a vision and they said that, uh, you know, some people are fighting against you and they have evil power, they have the power. Some witches and wizards, they are fighting against you. And they told me to come and tell you to warn you to take care, to be very careful about yourself. You say, is that all? They say yes. They say, why do you always see half vision? I don't see the whole vision. You only saw half. You didn't see the other part. The other part, let me, before you came, I knew it already. That they shall fight against me. That's what you have said. That's only half. But let me tell the other half before you go, they shall not prevail against me. They'll fight against you, but they'll not prevail. If they come against your own way, they'll fall seven times in Jesus' name. They shall fight against thee, but they shall not rebel against thee. For I am with thee, says the Lord, to deliver you. Are you still afraid? I said, are you still afraid? Before we pray, Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm reading verses 5 and 6. Hebrews 13 verses 5 and 6. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he has said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is your helper. Repeat it with me. The Lord is my helper. The Lord is my helper. And I will not fear what man shall do unto me. They have failed. You have succeeded. The power of the Lord is with you tonight. The protection of the Lord is with you tonight. The Lord is saying he's happy that you believe in holiness. It's happy that you are repenting. It's happy you are, you are getting your first love back. It's happy that you want to follow according to the word of the Lord. And he said, because you make the word of the Lord precious in your life, your life will be precious in the hand of the Lord. It will take care of you. And what the Lord is telling you tonight and for the rest of your life is, fear none, fear nothing, be faithful, the Lord will never let you down. Rise up and let us pray. Talk to the Lord and say, yes, Lord, now I understand. Now I know persecution cannot destroy me. Opposition will not destroy you. Whatever it is, the people of the world, whatever they are planning, they will fight against you, but they will never prevail. You will overcome. You will overcome. The eternal one is by your side. The I am that I am is supporting you. The first and the last, the beginning and the end, and the alpha and the omega is your divine constant companion. He will never leave you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. When you pass through a fire, it will not burn you. It may burn many other people. A thousand shall fall at thy side. And ten thousand on the other side. But that fire, it may burn other people. It will not burn you. The fire of the enemy. The fire of the Egyptians. The fire of the Ethiopians. The fire of the Assyrians. The fire of the witches and the wizards. The fire of the persecutors and the injurious people. That fire will never burn you. And when you go through the waters, you go through the waters, you are going through the waters, it will not drown you. The Lord is on your side. What are you afraid of? In the day and in the night, be not afraid. Be not afraid. Be not afraid. Emmanuel is with you. Emmanuel is with you. The Almighty is with you. The first and the last is with you. The one that conquered death is with you. What are you afraid about? Believe your God. Believe your God. You will prosper. You will prosper. Stand on the watch of the Almighty God. You will never be disappointed. Are you sick in your body? The first and the last. Is this is with you? Is a great physician. Is the one that gives strength to the weak. And it's the one that gives power to those who are fainting. It's the one that prospers the people that have some defeat or downfall or poverty in their lives. It says, you're rich. You're rich. You're rich. The promises of God make you rich. The grace of God makes you rich. The faith you have in the Lord makes you rich. Don't think you are poor because the people of the world say you are poor. It says, yes, I know, I know, I know. I know what they say, but you are rich. Believe the Lord.
believe the Lord, believe the Lord. Great, great, great are the promises of God for you. In Jesus' name we pray. If you can manage to stand up, do you mind standing up? Those who are sitting down, I understand you are tired, but let's, 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 let's bring the devil to shame now. And stand on your authority. And stand in the power of the Lord. And stand in the promise that the Lord has given you. Because you are, you are going to chase all those enemies and all those blasphemers and all those slanderers and all those people that are approaching. You are going to chase them in Jesus' name. The Lord has assured us tonight, all those people that fight against you, they will be as nothing. They will not hinder your Christian life. If you want to be holy, nobody can hinder you. If you want to be righteous, nobody can hinder you. If you want to be a missionary, nobody can hinder you. If you want to be a pastor, a preacher, nobody can hinder you. If you want to succeed in ministry, nobody can hinder you. Mark it down today that the sky is your limit. Because you are rich in faith. You are rich in the love of God. You are rich in the mercy of God. Cast away all your doubts and all your fears. You are climbing up. I said you are climbing up because all those enemies, they'll come to bow at your feet. Raise up your hand for your victory. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you tonight because of the promise you have given us. And we know that these promises are yes and amen. They are fulfilled already. Lord Jesus, we thank you because of the way you introduced yourself to us tonight. The first and the last. The beginning and the ending. The Alpha and the Omega. The one that was dead. But death can have no power, no dominion over you. Therefore you rose again. And that spirit that raised up Jesus Christ from the dead is dwelling in a mortal body. And that spirit of the living God, the spirit of life. And the spirit of resurrection will quicken our mortal bodies. Make us alive in Jesus name. Every form of discouragement, I cast it out. Every form of pity, self-pity, I cast it out. And that spirit of depression, I cast it out in Jesus' name. And that spirit or that attitude that is bending the knee and bowing the head and, you know, walking about as nobody because of the pressure of the world, because of the persecution of the world, because of the threatenings of the world, I cancel that sin in Jesus' name. From now on, all those who have been afraid, I command you and I impart it unto you now. Be bold in the Lord in Jesus' name. The fear of witches and the fear of wizards. And the fear of superstition and tradition. And the fear of those villagers. I cast out the spirit of fear out of your system in Jesus' name. I pray that the promises of God will be real to you, will be significant to you. And you can stand up straight and square your shoulders and look at the enemy on the face and say, you are more than a conqueror. You are more than a conqueror. Oh Lord, I pray tonight for your precious children, brothers and sisters, ministers of the gospel, preachers who are here, men and women. I'm asking, oh Lord, they will triumph. They will overcome. And all the people that try to fight against them, they will come to bend the knee before them in Jesus' name. I, I pray, O oh Lord, you have dominion and victory over sin. Over every form of sickness or affliction. And all the spell, all the charm, all the concoctions, all the curses, all the yoke coming from the world, they are broken and removed away from you in Jesus' name. And whatever it is that tied you down in your emotion, in your mind, in your spirit, in your heart, in your life, it, around you, that tied the rope around you that you couldn't get up and you couldn't move on and you couldn't climb the mountain and you couldn't climb the ladder of success. All the chains and all the ropes and all the fetters, they are broken in Jesus' name. Go out of this place and go and prosper. Go out of this place and go and succeed. Go in the strength of the Lord. 
that those you are afraid of before they'll turn around, they'll be afraid of you. And I pray and proclaim the victory of the Lord and a conquering spirit to enter into you that you will be more than a conqueror. You'll trample Satan under your feet, demons under your feet, sickness under your feet, weakness under your feet, poverty under your feet, defeat under your feet. And you go on now from now on, conquering and conquering and conquering and conquering in Jesus' name. Let the victory of the Lord be your possession. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. God bless you.